<clears throat> Let's ask the Lord to minister to us this morning. We need him to speak to us. Let's pray. Sweet, wonderful Jesus. <clears throat> oh, how we love you. Oh, how we praise you, Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, God, to be in your house, to be in your presence, to celebrate your resurrection today. Oh, God, what an honor. What a joy, Jesus, to be able to say, you are risen. You are risen indeed. And God, we love you and we thank you for what you're going to speak today. We thank you, God, for how you're going to minister today. We thank you, God, for how you're going to heal and move and restore in this sanctuary today. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Before we take our text this morning, I want to do a little bit of an experiment, and it's going to take you participating, okay? Um, so I promise it's going to lead to our lesson this morning, but I'm going to ask you, some of you may know this, some of you may not, and that's okay. I'm going to ask you to finish what I start. Please don't laugh at my choice. Who can take a sunrise, sprinkle it with dew, cover it with chocolate and a miracle or two? Yes, yes, absolutely. The candy man can. All right, when I say this quote, tell me what I'm quoting from. We, the people of the United States of America, the Declaration of Independence, Finish this song. Amazing how sweet the sound. And then finally, finish this verse. Then Peter said unto them, Amen. Shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What's my point this morning? Some of you are going, what is Sister Ray doing? Words, tunes, phrases can be said or sung that cause us to remember the entire verse, the entire song, or the entire quote. This is a technique that Jewish rabbis would use in Jesus' day called remez. A remez is a hint. It's a suggestion, an illusion, or a reminder of something so just like hearing the chorus of a song can prompt you to start singing the verses or the quoting of a single verse or phrase can cause you to remember that verse's original context that is what a remez is doing what we just did a moment ago were all samples of a remez part of me and I, I was like, I don't know that people would know this because I'm a little bit of a, a geek when it comes to President Abraham Lincoln. But I really wanted to do four score and seven years ago, and y'all hopefully would say the Gettysburg Address, but that would be a history lesson. Uh, a little over a week ago, this concept, this idea of a remez, a hint, an illusion, just, I didn't know what the term was called, but I was considering this tool and how it's used in scripture y'all read the new testament with the old testament in mind and you will see remez just scattered all over scripture um one of those is the the sermon that peter preached on the day of pentecost he constantly is referring to david or joel and when he referred to them what he was trying to get his audience to do was to remember that whole passage as I was considering this, a, a particular verse leaped off of my phone and into my heart. And as usually what happens is that my thoughts just began to explode, Pastor. I was on my way to Nolan's birthday party and my brain, I, I couldn't even get my brain on the cake because my mind was just going on this particular verse and everybody's going, what is she talking about? Psalm 22, 1. My God my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? When Jesus was on the cross, he quoted from Psalm 22. 
both Matthew and Mark record Jesus saying that. Let's read how Matthew wrote it. Matthew 27, 46 says, And about the ninth hour, so it was right before Jesus died, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All my life, every service I have ever heard that people have preached from Matthew or Mark always preached how Jesus related to our feelings of being forsaken while on the cross, and that is true. The prophet Isaiah even described the suffering Messiah in Isaiah 53.3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Jesus really did suffer rejection. He was forsaken by his followers. He was betrayed by the one who declared loyalty and love to him. Remember that old song, Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. I love Hebrews 4.15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Saints, rest assured, Jesus knows what it feels like to be forsaken, abandoned, and lonely. He understands how we feel when we struggle, and I am thankful for that. But this morning... As I was going through Psalm 22 a little over a week ago, all I could think of was there was an unspoken message that came from the cross. And I want to do my best to share with you what was exploding in my spirit all week. I was trying to explain it to a friend of mine last night, and I said, I don't know if I can, I don't, I don't know if I can do this justice because I feel this so strongly. I'm not so sure that I can communicate it well but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> so Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Referring to Psalm 22. But was Jesus really only referring to his abandonment feelings, to his feelings of suffering? Was he only referring to the cruelty of the cross? I question that because of the technique that I began this lesson with called a remez. Jesus was quoting from the first verse of Psalm 22, but he only quoted the first phrase. Why? Y'all know I like to ask why. But before I give the answer, we've got to talk about a few things first. And I'm going to do my best to do this. There is a Messianic Jew by the name of Diane Sherlock Fiera who described the effort that it would take for Jesus to even breathe, let alone speak from the cross. And it's worth noting today. Because of gravity, while hanging on the cross, the person's weight would hang down. So that to even take a breath, the crucified person would have to somehow lift themselves up, to lift their weight up, to somehow get enough air before having to lower their weight again because of exhaustion. So when soldiers would break the legs of those that were on a cross, they did it to try to speed up their death. You see, people on the cross, more likely than not, would die of asphyxiation or suffocation. So for Jesus just to simply breathe, he would have had to force his body upwards. But while doing that, he was sliding his raw, tattered back up a splintery, wooden cross inflicting even more pain and suffering just to breathe I also imagine that the crown of thorns would be pressed even further into his head as he was trying to pull himself push himself really up upon the cross and don't forget that his feet were nailed to the cross so he would have had to have used his feet to push himself up so pain would be searing through his body just to breathe. So when we consider 
that Jesus didn't just do that to breathe. He did that to speak words. The words are ridiculously important that Jesus would speak from the cross. Yet Jesus felt his words were so imperative. He went through all the pain, not just to breathe, but to speak to us from the cross. And all I could think as I was putting my thoughts together was, oh, Jesus, don't ever let us forget the sacrifice of the cross. So when Jesus comes up and he pushes himself up with all the pain searing through his body and he cries, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We know it's a direct quote from Psalm 22. But what was Jesus really trying to say? I think there was a whole lot more he was trying to say, Sister Pruitt, than just, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, I believe, after my study, that Jesus was using the technique called a remez. Jesus was trying to point the listeners to the whole of Psalm 22. And so, allow me today just to dig into Psalm 22 just a little bit. See, except for the Roman soldiers, everybody else gathered around the cross that pre-Passover Friday would have known the whole of Psalm 22. They would have known every verse, every phrase. They would have known every message that was coming from that psalm. The Pharisees and Sadducees immersed their daily lives in the study and memorization of the Old Testament. Even other Jews around the cross would have studied the psalms and would have known and been familiar with Psalm 22. So just as you and I hear the words, then Peter said unto them, we immediately think not just of Acts 2.38, but Acts 2.39 and Acts 2.1 through 4. We think of that whole passage about how God brought his presence into the life of his believers with the evidence of speaking in tongues. So understanding the technique of remez is going to help us as we dig into Psalm 22. And frankly, it's why my brain just exploded. And even last night as I was talking to a Muslim friend of mine, y'all, I got to share Jesus with my Muslim friend again. I got to share the beauty of the cross with my Muslim friend again. I got to share, Brother Plunkett, the beauty of resurrection with my Muslim friend. So by the time I got into bed, I couldn't hardly get to sleep because I was just, whoo, I got to share Jesus. We ought to be that excited about sharing Jesus with somebody. So as Psalms 22 is part of my daily Bible reading over a week ago, I was in complete and utter amazement. So I've got to read a few sections, and we're going to talk about those this morning because I believe there is an unspoken message from the cross that we can leave here today with peace and hope in our souls because it's beautiful, y'all. Psalm 22, 1 through 8 is the first section we're going to focus on. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and not silent, but thou art holy. O oh, thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. <laughs> They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despise of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. Didn't that happen to Jesus on the cross? They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. You see, Psalm 22 has been long recognized and recognized from the Pharisees and Sadducees even as a messianic psalm. That means that the psalm was prophesying of the coming Messiah, what he would do, what he would say, how he would be recognized, what would happen to him. So as I was going through Psalm 22 for, I don't know, the umpteenth time, the first thing that Jesus said without actually saying it it was prophesied that the Messiah would be forsaken, and the very fact that Jesus was quoting the psalm meant he was saying, I am your Messiah. Even on the cross, even while paying the price for our sin, Pastor Jesus was making it absolutely clear he was the promised Messiah. 
He was saying, all that, all of this that you're seeing was prophesied about me. Pay attention. You are literally seeing David's prophecy come to pass right in front of your eyes. He was pointing them to prophecy. Now, see, to this day, Jews do not believe in a suffering Savior. That's one major reason why they refuse to accept Jesus as their Messiah, because he suffered so much. But the truth of the matter is, is that it was prophesied. And you and I are in this building today because he did suffer. He did die, and he did rise again. Oh, thank God that Jesus took and paid the price for you and me. The next, thing, the next thing that Jesus said without actually saying it was, you have mocked me and your very words were prophesied. Because they did. They looked at Jesus on the cross and said, he said that he would be delivered and rescued. Let somebody come and deliver him. It was prophesied that, he, that they would say that in Psalm 22. But don't lose touch of what Jesus said in verses 3 and 5. But thou art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel, our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. O oh, saints, Jesus looked at them from the cross in the middle of all the pain, and he said, things might be looking really bad right now, but there is hope and deliverance is coming. That's a message of hope from the cross. And I am grateful for that kind of hope. Y'all, there are times when I am suffering, when, I, when I'm feeling lonely, when I'm feeling rejected. Y'all, when we feel that way, we can look at the cross and say, oh, there might be rejection right now. Oh, there might be pain right now. But oh, there's hope. Because those that trust in the name of the Lord their God will be delivered. There is hope found in the cross. I am just ate up with this this morning. If we go to the next section, Psalm 22, verses 14 through 18, the, the psalmist writes, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They parted my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Saints, that was not written in the New Testament. That was David writing prophetically of exactly what would happen to the Lord Jesus. You see what is happening at this point in time. Jesus is calling the Pharisees and the Sadducees out here. He's saying, the very piercings of my hands and of my feet, the very mocking that you have done towards me has been prophesied, and you know it. So again, without actually saying it, Jesus was saying, what's happening here today, what you are seeing right now was prophesied of your Messiah. You are literally seeing prophecy happen in just that one phrase, y'all. Jesus brought the entire psalm to their remembrance. The Pharisees and Sadducees knew exactly what Jesus was saying. They knew. And so I began to think, that's scary. Because knowing what Jesus was saying, knowing what Jesus was referring to, they continued to mock him. They continued, even though it was right in front of their eyes, looking at his pierced hands, looking at his pierced feet, watching the Roman soldiers without having any clue that it was prophesied, cast lots for Jesus' garment. They knew, the Pharisees knew that they were watching prophecy happen right in front of their eyes, and yet they refused to accept it. Oh, saints, let's not look and see what God is doing in front of our very eyes and refuse to see it because our eyes are on something else. I know for me, when I get all caught up in my emotions, which all, it all happens here, y'all. When I get caught up in things that I'm getting all worried and anxious about, yes, I do get anxious. Yes, I do get worried. When I get all caught up in that, it's hard for me to see the good in the middle of the bad. It's hard for me to have hope when I'm feeling so stressed out. 
It's human nature. We can't really blame the Pharisees and Sadducees an awful lot too much because you and I have done the very same thing. But oh, let us kneel before the cross once again today and look up and not just see a suffering Savior, but see the hope that he is bringing to us through his suffering. Let's get to the good stuff. Psalm 22, verses 22 to 28. This is all in the same psalm, y'all. It's bad until you get to Psalm 22. It's talking about all, or Psalm, verse 22. It's all talking about mocking and suffering and being left alone and all this crazy stuff. But oh my word. When you get to verse 22 of Psalm 22, the psalmist writes, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation, will I? Praise thee. You that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard, My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied they shall praise the lord that seek him your heart shall live forever all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the lord and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee for the kingdom is the lord's he is the governor among the nations oh y'all when i got to verse 22 i was just like glory i couldn't hardly stand it when i got to that last section because there are some things that jesus said there that we don't always catch from the cross you see what jesus was actually saying without saying it it's the unspoken message from the cross he was saying you think i'm despised and rejected but i ain't <laughs> god has not hidden his face from me he has heard my cry it might look like it's not going right now but you just wait there's worship coming i am the king i will rule and all nations will worship me That excites me. Jesus was declaring that he was both Messiah and king of the universe from the cross. In the middle of his suffering that all would bow down and worship him. This psalm of suffering and despair ends in victory. Y'all, when Jesus was on the cross, he wasn't just saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, Sister Carrie? He was saying, I might look forsaken now, but you just wait. I'm going to be your king. You're going to worship me. You're going to get victory from all of this. Jesus didn't only embrace the horrors of the crucifixion. He claimed the triumph of resurrection. Oh, saints. It eats me up because Jesus said, this is not the ending. It is just the beginning. So let's be real. It's no wonder the Pharisees and Sadducees mocked him. They could not accept that Jesus was their true Messiah. They could not comprehend that the one who came to deliver them would bring deliverance through such intense suffering. No wonder they crucified him. No wonder, though, the thief on the cross asked Jesus to remember him in paradise. Imagine what the thief heard and saw and felt coming from those powerful words because that thief would have been Jewish as well. He would have known Psalm 22 as well. He would have known exactly what Jesus was saying as well. It's no wonder the thief said, Jesus, remember me this day when you are in paradise. It's no wonder Jesus looked at him and said, you're going to be with me today in paradise. I love what Jesus was saying without even saying it from the cross. It is not a message of down and out and under. Sister Carrie, it's a message of hope. No wonder the Roman soldier boldly declared that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. And saints, no wonder you and I are here today able to celebrate that our Messiah Jesus paid the ultimate price for our sins on the cross and conquered death, hell, and the grave, rising triumphantly on that resurrection morning. Jesus 
unspoken message from the cross amazes me because of how it fulfills prophecy, declaring that he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He declared that all would come before him and worship. He declared the greatest victory after what seemed to be the greatest defeat. Can I tell you on this resurrection morning that Jesus didn't just get victory for himself, On the cross, he got victory for you and for me. There is hope and there is freedom and there is deliverance when we look at the cross of Calvary. We'll be able to say with the saints, he is my king. He is the one who rules. He is the one who reigns. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Can we praise the Lord right now for that? Oh, thank you, God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, I bless your name. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What was the unspoken message from the cross? The cross was not the ending. It's just the beginning. The cross was not just about Jesus sacrifice and suffering it was about his deliverance from death and our ultimate deliverance from sin it's the good news y'all and have you ever considered after psalm 22 comes psalm 23 no wonder david could say the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures he leadeth me beside the still water because of the hope that we find, Sister Wanda, in Psalm 22, because of the remez on the cross. Will you stand with me? Y'all, I'm excited about celebrating Easter this year. Most of the time, I find myself just wanting to be weepy and kneeling at the cross, and that's a good thing, and I, I did that this week, just in And I'm sure it will happen again today as we partake in communion. It's such a solemn thing to do that. But y'all, let those tears not be tears of sorrow. Oh, take time to repent. We're going to need to make sure our hearts are clean before we take communion. But oh, saints, turn and look at the cross in hope. Look at the cross in victory. Because every healing that you need was paid for on the cross. Every victory that you need was paid for at the cross. My faith has been increased by considering Psalm 22 this week. By considering what Jesus has done. I pray that this has increased your faith. Let's pray in the name of Jesus. God, we're so thankful. Oh, thank you, God, for the words that you speak to us through your word. Thank you, Jesus, that even just a little hint, oh, God, can remind us of your victory and the hope that you give your children. Father, I pray that you would give us, your saints, your children, your people, Jesus, today, the victory, oh, God, that we see coming down from the cross. Lord, I pray, Jesus, that we would grab a hold of healing. I pray, Jesus, that we would grab a hold of deliverance. Jesus, I pray that we would grab a hold of hope today, that we would grab a hold of the peace and the joy that you intend to give us as your people. Jesus, be magnified and glorified. Be lifted high today. Oh, King of glory, Messiah and Savior of the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we worship him right now?
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Y'all are dismissed in Jesus' name. Let's get ready for worship service. I'm ready to celebrate, y'all, in Jesus' name.